title of the video? Video 39 something about Colombia. These last few days have just been so warm in the Northeast, but I don't know what happened. It just got so cold all of a sudden going from sweating to chilly weather, or I guess you can say sweater weather. Oh wait, wait, what, 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 what is this? I'm going to Colombia. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Bianca and I will be a neuroscience PhD student at Columbia this upcoming August. Only a few more months and you'll see scenery changes, set changes, and maybe a slightly more haphazard demeanor as I try to find an apartment, buy all new furniture, move my entire life, and figure out how to actually be a New Yorker without turning into a puddle of window AC drippings. Bruh. That's kind of gross, but I guess I'll experience those random drops of water from the sky, aka window AC units in New York. But since moving and program logistics are at the forefront of my mind, what a perfect way to show everyone my sanity slowly unraveling from the stress of not being able to secure an apartment until July because danger. most listings are for immediate move-in only. <laughs> oh, the joys of New York, living in an overpriced box without modern amenities. But I guess that's most cities at this point. This video, ah, if you, if you hear a lisp, I just got Invisalign and it's really hard to speak. <laughs> this video is gonna be a bit different than my usual content, but if you guys want more sneak peeks into parts of my life beyond just language content, You'll see them scurrying across my channel like those insane New York rats. <laughs> pizza, pizza. But how did I get into Colombia? And how can you get into Colombia? We will tackle those questions today. And in this video, we'll go through what to focus on as an undergrad if a master's or a PhD is something that you want to pursue in the future. Next week, I'll go through the nitty gritty details of my own personal grad school application process. My resume, GPA, research experiences, schools that I got into, schools that I got ghosted from, etc. And hopefully it'll give you a better idea of what to expect and how to tailor your application for any schools that you may be interested in. And if you have any particular questions that you want answered, feel free to leave them in the comments. So without further ado, if you are an undergrad or perhaps a recent graduate, how can you get into an IB grad program? How do you make your CV as OP as MOB and the Body Improvement Club? If you are a first generation immigrant like myself, you may have heard your parents say something along the lines of, get good grades in high school, get into an Ivy League college, become a doctor, or perhaps a lawyer, depending on your parents. Basically, Ivy or bust. Well, guess what? I did not go to an Ivy undergrad, and I'm doing pretty great for myself. I'm making six figures right now working at a biotech company, and I am giving it all up for a barely livable stipend in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yeah. yeah. Look at me now with my future doctorate of philosophy. Let me philosophize all of your neural issues. <laughs> And after my mediocre high school performance, I got into a pretty good private university. And thank goodness I got a full ride or else I would be drowning in student loan debt. But I didn't go to an Ivy or a top 10 or even a top 20 school. I was not valedictorian and I wasn't top of my class. I didn't get all A's. My first two semesters were actually pretty trash. And why do I say this? Well, in the eyes of the graduate school acceptance committees, the undergraduate institution you went to matters less than what you did at said institution. Grad school is competitive. You should do as well as you can, and even at your best, you may not get into your dream programs. But if you want to get into great masters or PhD programs, don't let your undergraduate institution limit how high you dream. So how do you get into Columbia? Make your own opportunities. I am a STEM girl, so my first move when going to college was to try to find labs that I could work in. And being a first gen kid, I kind of had to navigate college and figure out what the hell I needed to do on my own. And luckily I did have an older sister that went through the process a few years ahead of me and helped me out. Well, I guess I still have an older sister. <laughs> English is a pretty weird language, but regardless, I had to learn pretty quickly that if I want to get a good job, I need experience. And what is the pseudo currency that justifies our worth in the eyes of employers as less than qualified undergraduate students? Experience! 
can you guys guess what undergrad I went to? And if you did not ascribe to the co-op cult, it's basically internships and part-time work throughout undergrad. Now, how does one find a lab, let alone a lab that actually pays you when you're a freshman with absolutely no usable skills, Bruh. besides staying up for 36 hours right before a major exam? I can also eat an entire box of extreme flavor ba blasted, flavor blasted goldfish in an hour. And I'm not talking about the small bags, but those huge cardboard boxes of goldfish that are bigger than your head. But one way to go about finding a lab is to just cold email professors of interest. Go through your professor and see what their research is about. Take note that you may get ghosted by certain professors, but you can also ask a professor that you have a great relationship with. But labs may not always be available. They may not have enough funding to take another student, even if the fit between you and that lab is amazing. So if you're looking at your current undergrad situation and you just can't find a lab that fits you at all, what do you do? Just resign to the fact that you'll never be able to pursue your research dreams? No, you make your own opportunities. If you're in a city, find nearby schools or hospitals that have labs that you're interested in. Cold email professors or even ask your professors if they know anyone in their network that has research interests aligned with yours. It may take a bit, but utilize your surroundings. Utilize everyone in your network. Although it may be small at this point in your career, it will continue to grow and grow. Make opportunities for yourself. It's really challenging to get into your first lab because you don't have any legitimate skills. So market yourself well by really paying attention to your biology, chem, genetics labs in your courses. Yes, all the experiments fail. <laughs> Some fail spectacularly, but I used to do Western blots all day back in my first academic lab. Knowing about and being able to talk about the techniques and their utility in the specific area of research you're looking to get into will put you ahead of the pack, even if your technique is not there yet because they always fail during your courses. So what is the mark of a successful student, a successful researcher, a successful person? Someone that seeks out the things that they're looking for. Someone that isn't afraid to fail or get rejected or get ghosted. Someone who is willing to put themselves out there. So now you found a lab that you can join, but what's next? Make your own opportunities. Wait, I, th I thought we already did that? <laughs> Throughout your career and just life in general, the overarching thesis is this make your own opportunities. Especially in career, you can't slow down on creating new avenues for yourself. Everyone jokes about networking, but it's actually a really important skill to have. Once you get into your lab, learn as much as you can from your supervisor, postdoc, boss, whatever you wanna call it. Ask them to teach you things beyond the scope of your project. Show interest in the other projects that they're a part of. Watch them do other things. Pay attention to how they present things. Ask to be involved. Seek out other postdocs in the lab. Ask them what they're doing. Ask them to teach you techniques. Be as involved as you can in the lab. Be a good coworker and help out wherever you can. People love seeing passionate students and are willing to go to bat for you if you show interest in what they do. View your lab members as future coworkers. Research is really small. So if you stay in the field, you'll probably work with them again. I've already worked with four former coworkers at three separate labs and I am only 25. Treat everyone with respect and not just because you want those letters of recommendation. Humility goes a long way and will help you to make long lasting relationships and mentors that you can reach out to years later for career advice or anything else that you may need. Once you're in your lab and have a good relationship with your coworkers, what is the most important thing to do? How do you improve your CV in the eyes of the Graduate Admissions Committee? Independence. What is the point of a PhD? To make you an independent researcher. So how do you impress the adcom? Showing them that you're already an independent researcher. Don't just view your lab as a daily task list to check off and leave. This will be more challenging advice, but if you want to get into competitive graduate programs, you will need to put in the effort. Depending on your field, and especially for STEM, you need to differentiate yourself amongst other students that also have research. And how do you do that? By showing independence. Now, technically, research isn't a requirement to get into programs. PhD is supposed to teach you how to be an independent research. 
don't just learn how to do techniques. Learn why that technique is being used in that particular situation. What's the bigger picture? What's the question that we're trying to answer? Why did we even choose this particular experiment? What are the limitations? Don't just learn about your project. How does your project fit into the field? And what are the limitations of said project? What questions can we answer within the scope of this project? Can you propose new project directions considering the unknown knowledge of the field? What are these questions teaching you? How to basically write papers, to write grants, Independent researchers drive projects, which culminate in the formation of grants and the publication of papers. How do you convince ADCOM or future employers that you're able to do more independent research? By being able to talk about your research beyond superficial techniques. By understanding the purpose behind your research through publications, posters, and talks. Upon applying to graduate programs, I had seven publications, four posters, and four talks. Two publications, I was a second author and the rest were middle authors. And for those of you unaware of publication culture and science, first authors are the main project lead. It's a huge accomplishment, so it looks amazing. For more junior members like me, anywhere in the top four authors is, is really great. And middle authorship means that you contributed a bit, but it wasn't a major project for you. So try to get on as many papers as you can. Remember what I said about reaching out to other lab members to learn techniques and to help them out with their work? This is another reason why you should do that. Everything you do for a project will give you a higher authorship on the resulting paper. Although you should note that not everything you do will result in a paper, unfortunately. Now, when you're choosing a lab, check out the publication history, because some labs just don't publish that frequently, which will make it harder to get on papers. Generally, postdoc heavy labs will publish more papers. Larger labs will probably publish more than smaller labs. But although publications are very helpful to increase the competitiveness of your resume, it's not a requirement. If your lab doesn't give you those opportunities, that's all right. Try to show independent research in other ways. Make your own opportunities. Not everyone in my cohort has papers on their resume, but they were to show excellence and passion and independence in other ways. The reality is that grad school is competitive, especially this cycle. The reality is that you'll probably have to put in a lot of effort. You will probably have to put in late nights and you will definitely have to work hard. But it's not an impossible dream to go to an amazing grad program. Throughout your undergraduate career, if you're able to, what? Join a lab or internship or work experience that corresponds to your area of interest. And two, create opportunities to show independent work and you'll be ahead of the pack. But what does four to five years of putting this framework into practice look like? Tune in next week where I'll go through my grad apps and show all my stats, all my rejections, all my acceptances, and my thoughts about the overall process. But if you enjoyed this video, please give me a like, comment, share, and subscribe. And let me know if you have any other questions about the grad school application process. I won't have all the answers, but I will do my best to answer them from my experience. I only know about the biology side of PhD programs, a little bit about the chem side because they have people in my current company who have told me about their chemistry PhD applications, but granted it was like 10 years ago. So we'll, we'll see, but if it's more general info, maybe I'll know it's, if it's for different fields, then I may not have the answer, but I will try my best. But thank you so much for watching this video. Um, Check out my Patreon if you're interested. It's different content, but maybe I can start incorporating some of my science stuff in there too. If you guys are interested, just let me know in the comments and I'll figure that out. But I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.